Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity to present to you today. Um, my name is Tim, uh, and I'm the head of NBN Local for South Australia and the Northern Territory. Um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, um, the Larrakia people, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. So, hopefully, the title got you got you in today. The NBN effect. Um, I guess we're scheduled to be, our build is scheduled to be um, three quarters complete in the coming weeks uh, and completely built by the year 2020. So I think my time today presents a good opportunity to talk about the impact that NBN has had, um, or as we like to call it, the NBN effect. Um, we've just had some recent research come out, so I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, but before we jump into that, I just want to go back to pre-NBN just for a moment. So this was the, I guess, the broadband challenge that our country faced um, about 10 years ago, probably a little bit, yeah, about 10 years ago, I think. Um, no question that internet access was uneven across the country. Um, this was a real surprise to me when I started that, you know, there were 700,000 premises across Australia that didn't actually have access to fixed broadband internet. Okay, and for those that did, um, more than half of them actually received really poor speeds, so sub nine megabits per second. Um, and it's probably no surprise when you piece all that together that Australia barely scraped into the top 50 uh, for internet speeds worldwide. So when NBN came together um, in 2009, it had a fairly simple purpose, a massive task, but a fairly simple purpose, which was really to connect Australia, to make sure that every home and business in Australia could access fast and reliable internet. <laughs> We have like a motherhood statement to say we want to bridge the digital divide. So the digital divide between old and young, the digital divide between city and country, uh, the digital divide between Australia and the rest of the world. And that's really what drives us uh, at NBN every day. Um, I get a lot of satisfaction out of the work we do in, in regions and in, and in remote communities, and um, this is a big, big driver of all of that. Um, Bearing in mind, we have this purpose, and, but we also have some business goals. So we've been given $49 billion of funding to deliver this project. Uh, it's the largest infrastructure project undertaken in Australia, and it literally does touch every premises across the country. Um, our target is 8 million connected premises by the year 2020. Um, just yesterday, we announced 4 million connected. So we're halfway there, which is a, a huge milestone. We are a government business enterprise, so we do need to return uh, a profit to the government, uh, and we're well on the way to generating our revenue targets. And as we continue to get closer to the end of our build, um, they will increase. We've got to do all of this while trying to maintain a positive experience for people when connecting to the NBN. And unfortunately, I don't have to go to too many presentations where we have people who've had a less than perfect experience along the way. Customer experience is a tricky one um, for us because the, the end user or the, the internet user is technically not our customer. They don't transact with NBN. As you know, NBN's a wholesaler um, and you need to go through a, a retailer. But we certainly have taken uh, the customer experience on board. We know that it's because of the NBN that people are making a move or making a decision about their telecommunications. So we want to have a positive impact on that. While all the, all the um, while making sure um, our employer metrics uh, are up there, we, we like to think of NBN as a great place to work. I've certainly enjoyed my time at NBN, been there over two and a half years now. Um, it's a really diverse, dynamic organisation. Um, we do have an advantage of being, you know, only about eight years old, eight or nine years old, um, but. I guess don't want to lose sight of a customer experience and an employee experience while undertaking this huge task. This shows you a little bit about our journey. So NBN Co was formed in 2009 by the then Labor government and the first service was activated in 2011. Um, in 2013, the, the new Liberal government mandated what we call a multi-technology mix. So they said, you must deliver NBN to every single premises in Australia still. Um, but you must use the most appropriate technology of the time. Okay, so we had a lot of, a lot of areas in build at that time, um, such as Darwin, uh, which has fibre to the premises, uh, but that was a, a bit of a change in direction for us at this time. 
The original mandate stayed the same though, which was to connect every home and business across Australia and provide fast and reliable internet. That is access to speeds of 25 megabits per second download and 5 megabits upload. Then you can see we started to hit some big numbers, so over half a million connected in 2015. Later on in 2015, we launched our first satellite, which was a huge milestone uh, for the business, um, meaning that some of the most remote areas of Australia could finally connect to internet. In 2016, we launched our second satellite, and both of those are in service and working really well at the moment and really changing the way people use internet in really remote areas of Australia. And then we started to really hit scale. So 2016, we had a million activations. 2017, we hit 2 million. And as I mentioned just yesterday, um, we hit 4 million people connected to the network. Um, and again, our aim is by 2020 uh, to have 8 million homes and businesses connected. If we look at the territory, um, much more progressed than the rest of the country, which is, again, quite exciting and a great opportunity for people living in the territory. So we've got over 92,000 homes and businesses right now that can connect to NBN. About 98% complete, it's probably more than 98% more than complete, besides a few fixed wireless towers to come. Um, almost every home and business can connect. And what I think is fantastic for us here in Darwin is Darwin at the moment is the only fully connected mainland capital city. So the build hasn't even really reached scale in all the other capital cities around Australia yet Darwin has almost 50,000 premises, homes and businesses in the city and the suburbs uh, with direct fibre all the way to the premises. Um, and by the end of this year, that number up the top will be, well, 100%. It will be every single premises in the Northern Territory will be able to connect. And the slide you haven't covered the Tiwi Islands or Kuta Islands, they have any NBN? They definitely do. The Tiwi Island has access by Skymuster, um, and Groot Island would be the same. We've actually got some pretty... Um, We've got to, if I get time, I'll show you afterwards. We've got some pretty um, cool pictures of some of the installs on Groot Island. Absolutely. Um, so I guess, like, talking a little bit about the data, I think um, Census Night in August 2016 um, marked a point where about one in three homes could connect to the MBN network. So it gave us a good opportunity um, to take a snapshot of areas that could connect to MBN versus areas where MBN hasn't rolled out yet. Um, Sorry, I've got a message come up on my screen. Um, and shortly after the, I guess, the census data came out, NBN commissioned an independent research company called Alpha Beta um, to undertake some research for us. Um, you can see, obviously, the snapshot is every Australian 10 million households over 2,000 regions. Um, so what we did, what we did was we commissioned Alpha Beta to look at this census data by region. Uh, but also undertake a, an additional survey where they spoke with 3,500 respondents across 1,700 postcodes right across the nation. And um, the results, which I'll show you in a moment, are evidence that NBN is delivering on its purpose to uh, drive economic and social benefits for, for Australians. So what we've been able to see, and, um, and again, this is, this is some of our top-line data, and we'll, we'll keep exploring this um, you know, over the coming weeks, but... You can see new business generation um, just in 2017 alone in areas that had the NBN um, between, well, between 2,000 and 5,000 new businesses generated. And that's expected, NBN's expected to generate up to anywhere up to 80,000 new businesses by the year 2021, so the year post our rollout. Um, it's also been had some great results for self employed people or start up businesses, if you like. So. You know, between three and six thousand um, new self-employed people, um, and up to ninety thousand uh, by the time the rollout is completed. Um, some of the really, um, or some of the great statistics, I guess, were around Australian women um, and what the NBN effect is having on on um, on women. Um, the number of self-employed women in NBN regions grew at an average of two point three percent compared to just 0.1%. percent. Um, for, for non-NBN areas. So that means it's um, 20 times more likely um, that a woman will be able to start her own business and become self-employed in an area where NBN exists um, as to where it doesn't. And we had an event in, um, in South Australia recently. We had the minister down and there was a, a young girl in Mount Gambia in the southeast of our state, so big, quite a big regional centre, I guess, and um, 
she'd had her, she'd started up her own business um, just a year ago, and some of her headpieces that she designed are being worn in in fashion shows in New York. Um, and she runs this business from from Mount Gambier over an MBN connection, which was really exciting for us to see, and and hopefully we'll uncover a lot more of those stories uh, as we go. Um, when we look at those stats. Um, broken down into, into the territory. Um, and again, they're, they're, they're bracketed numbers, but we can see that in NBN, uh, the rollout of NBN's generated between 50 and 150 new businesses, um, and that's expected to possibly hit up to 700 new businesses by 2021. Again, self-employed, up to 170 people self-employed in areas where the NBN's been rolled out, um, and that, that number could increase to nearly 1,000 by, by the year post our rollout. Um, one thing NBN obviously offers, um, or connectivity offers, is the ability to work flexibly. Um, certainly where I work at NBN, we're encouraged to work flexibly where possible. And you can see that our stats show an additional 70 people were able to work primarily from home due to the increased connectivity that they had at home. And hopefully that'll be up to around 400 people in the Northern Territory that'll be enjoying that lifestyle or that work-life harmony. Um, piece by the year 2021. So again, the Alpha Beta research shows us that, you know, you would have seen that stat I put up at the start where Australia was 48th in the world. Um, when we started the, well, a couple of years into NBN, um, we were still down in 29th for internet access and speed from of those OECD ranked countries. Slowly moving up to 17th last year, and after that, the research predicts we'll be well and truly entrenched in the top 10 in 2021 um, post our rollout. Um, so some pretty exciting numbers for us. And um, I guess really the first real signs that, um, that NBN is having a positive impact uh, across the country. So I spoke at the start about customer experience and I just wanted to show you a little bit about um, what we're trying to do to improve our customer experience. We've um, opened the book, so to speak, um, earlier this year, and we now release monthly metrics on our website where we have, we have 10 metrics um, that we monitor each month and we report on each month. Um, and I'll just I'll run you through these, a quick overview. I've just picked, pulled out three where we've made significant ground. So installed right first time, so not installing things in cupboards. Um, you know, we're up to 91% of getting it right the first time. And if I go back a year, that was down at 86%. And if we go back another year, it's probably even lower. So trending in the right direction there. Network congestion, um, so downtime or, um, or throttle, it was a real problem for us last year. Um, but with some changes to our pricing and putting a bit of extra pressure on our service providers, um, we've been able to reduce the average bandwidth congestion to about 18 minutes per week. Um, when you look 12 months ago, it was nearly six hours a week. Okay, so really working hard on that. And fixing our faults. So when you do report a fault um, to your service provider, how often do we get on top of that or how quickly do we get on top of that? We have pretty strict KPIs around fault um, resolution. Pleased to report that that is also trending in the right direction. And in May, we had 90% um, of our faults resolved within the agreed timeframes compared to less than 60 only 12 months ago. Um, any time that's less than 100% is not ideal for us, um, but it's good to see that's trending in the right direction. Um, and we, we have got a, I guess, a really strong focus on customer experience at the moment. Uh, and we're hoping that these graphs will continue to trend in the right direction. If any of you are interested in looking, finding out more about this, on our homepage, nbn.com.au, it's pretty much the first thing you see. Um, you can get measurements across the 10 metrics, or you can look back at our, our previous monthly reports. Um, I guess as we get toward uh, the end of the rollout, um, you know, we now need to look at um, how we continue to monitor and upgrade, or maintain, sorry, and upgrade this network. So um, I guess we have a roadmap talking about the future development of NBN. Once we complete our build, we're still the owner and operator of that infrastructure. So we will need to continue to upgrade and evolve our products to meet the needs. Um, 
We have a big push into the business space at the moment. So you would have seen, um, I put up, sorry, some, some revenue at the start on that first slide. We do need to return a, a revenue to government and we've had a big push into the business space at the moment because as you would expect, business customers spending a lot more on their telecommunications. So business grade products, we just, just yesterday announced that we've got a business support um, call centre and, and technicians on the ground what we call an enterprise ethernet product. So what we've rolled out across the country at the moment is really a residential grade service. Okay, but we now have um, uh, business products available where a business can get a committed, what we call a committed information rate um, or a guaranteed speed, if you like, 24-7. Uh, they can also have faster response times to emergencies. Um, you do pay for that, but the, the product is available. We have an ICT channel program where we, we are accrediting local IT providers, um, such as someone like Area 9 perhaps would be relevant to Darwin, um, to advocate on our behalf and um, help, help customers or help end users make smart decisions when they're looking at their NBN products. So far as our technologies go, they're all upgradable. So fibre to the premises, which is all through Darwin, um, we certainly, the upgrade path for that is a hundred times faster than what it can do at the moment, which is probably too fast for what we need it for now, but, but a great upgrade path. When you look at things like fixed wireless, um, we'll be looking at 5G technology, deploying 5G technology on our fixed wireless network to continually increase the speeds. So as we roll out technologies, uh, we always ensure there's an upgrade path uh, because while our commitment now is to deliver access to 25 megabits per second wherever you live, Obviously, that demand is going to increase into the future. Because if we look at some of the, I like this slide, if we look at some of the, you know, the demand for connectivity that, you know, we all know it, we all know about, this is a graphic that shows you what happens in one minute on the internet. So this is a worldwide figure. It's not, um, not based on Australia. But, for example, in the time I've had this slide up, there have been three and a half million searches on Google. Every minute, 156 million emails get sent. Nearly a million people log into Facebook every minute. That's probably not so hard to believe, that one. Um, this one always fascinates me. So Amazon.com, um, $265,000 worth of sales in one minute on the internet. So I guess the demand for connectivity is literally growing by the minute. Um, and it's not just our computer that we want connected anymore. You know, it's our smartphone, it's our television. Um, just about every appliance you can buy now has a connected version. Fridges, toothbrushes, coffee machines, all of that sort of stuff is connected. So we need a network that can support this now, um, but also into the future. Because again, um, one, of our stat, one of our studies shows that the average home is expected to have 29 connected devices in it by 2020 when we finish our rollout. I think that number is about 13 right now. If any of you have children at home like I do, you can hit that number pretty easily. Um, so again, talking every, everything from connected security systems, watering systems, climate control, not to mention the two TVs in your house, the three smartphones, the iPad and so on. So again, we, we need a network that's, yes, there's some, there's some great social and economic impact, but you know, there's also this lifestyle, this smart lifestyle that, um, that people want to lead and, and we need a network that's going to support that. I touched on business, business before, business growth and, and the opportunities for business are huge as well. This is um, just some numbers I pulled from a, a Deloitte economics report that I guess they categorise digital maturity of a business into four, advanced, high, intermediate and basic. So for example, if you're at a basic level, you might have a business email address um, and you're listed in an online directory but by a third party. Okay, 23% um, of businesses in Australia are still in that, in that category. And what we want NBN to be able to do is help you climb that ladder of digital maturity um, and, and increase your opportunities. Um, you know, we'd love to get everyone up to at least a high level where you're using, where you have an online store, you're using multiple online platforms to promote your business, you're doing some search engine optimization, and certainly you're using cloud-based applications in your business to become more efficient. Uh, because my next slide is going to compare a basic business to an advanced business, um, and there's, you know, some real benefits there. 
um, eight times more likely to create grow, uh, create jobs, one and a half times more likely to grow your revenue, um, and I think it goes without saying, you know, more likely to innovate. This one's a great one as well. Seven times more likely to be exporting your product um, if you're online. Um, so just to wrap up, I think we're, you know, we, we're about to hit 75% um, build completion and hopefully this has given you a bit of a, um, I guess a bit of a story about where we've come and where we're going and, and the impact that we're starting to see um, as a result because, you know, this research now gives us evidence that NBN is bringing prosperity to communities and empowering communities. Um, you know, we, we've announced 4 million connected yesterday. We hope to have 8 million connected if I was standing here in, in two years talking to you. Um, and I think it's a really great story and, and, and I thank you for, uh, for letting me share it with you today. Um, so I think I might take some questions here and then um, if we've got some time I'll step you through a little bit about what my team uh, as MBN Local are doing across the country and um, some of the ways we're trying to showcase some of the technology that we're delivering. What's the running temperature of the NBN box? Oh. Outside, That's a question I've never been asked before. Um, I, I wouldn't know. It would, but I, I know the devices are. You know, they're not supposed to be in direct sunlight. Um, they're certainly supposed to be where they can be accessible and where they can breathe. So. Um, Important to me when I was looking at the problems. So we mm. put the last one on the draft. Yep. Uh, and I put the thermometer on twenty-two on the outside and twenty on the top. And just quickly checking. Okay. That should be fine, I would have thought. Yeah, yeah. I, and I, unless it was extremely hot, that's where I thought you were going. Um, that shouldn't be an issue. That should, shouldn't be an inhibitor to service quality, that's for sure. Um, I, I hear you mentioning we've got priority to the house. Yes. Been, um, so we're the only place in Australia pretty much that has a priority to the house. And yep. recently, and it's kind of part of the story, it's not the year, we just received a new box Wi-Fi mm -hmm. instead of in a house, it means to be a bit better, but I'm not seeing any difference. Um, Who sent you that? Was it NBN or Telstra? That I think it's Telstra. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's probably your modem, um, which is a Telstra issue. Have you received anyone else? Yes, my neighbour's just got a new one. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, the first day it was great. The second day. Yeah. I, it seems yeah. to be eating a lot too, so... I can't, well, because it's not MBN equipment, I can't really advise you on that, other than to talk to the, the manufacturer of that or the, the provider of that equipment. So would that be also with the power of the house? Yes. We have the best uh, broadband. Access to, yeah, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So we have, we certainly have suburbs and, and some country towns like Victor Harbour, like only, well, Catherine has fibre to the premises. Um, in South Australia, Victor Harbour and Port Augusta have a, a number of suburbs of Adelaide, but no other mainland capital city will have fibre to every premises. Yeah, absolutely. And it's the, the Darwin City precinct and the suburbs as well. Um, and again, one of the... Yes, you got some heartache by being built first because we, if we were going to make mistakes, we probably made them here. But on the flip side, you know, you do have the, the best technology. And um, I guess... It's hard. one of the one of the things that I I took over um, MBN Local for Northern Territory in October, and I thought, well, the build's nearly done. Like, what sort of impact can I make? And I think remote communities was one, but also in metro areas, how can we get businesses to understand that you know they have access to fibre directly to their premises? So they could probably they're probably on residential grade services, uh, whereas they could be realising a lot more data. Um, they could be doing things a lot quicker. Um, just because they've got access to that fibre network. Um, same goes for residential people as well. You know, the, the service, you know, the, the, the advantage of the fibre going all the way to the home is, you know, there is no break between the network and the home. So um, potentially it could be doing a lot more for people than they realise. So we really, we're working hard in the business space up here. We're, we're going to talk with the NT government on Thursday about... Um, They've got some funding to make can make Darwin a smart city. I don't know if that's widely known, but um, so we're going to have a chat with them to see if you know we've got NBN fibre all through Darwin City. How can they use that? Put the ten mil into into um, other infrastructure and use the fibre beneath their feet to 
to deliver um, some world class services. So. Mm -hmm. mm. I guess with my broadband push hat on, yes. I'm really curious to see what we're going to be able to do for our very regional and remote areas. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I guess I, I did have a slide about um, business grade products um, and I probably didn't explore that quite enough. So most of our, I'll come to you in a minute, sir, sorry, I'll just answer that one. Um, so we do have satellite technology. I mentioned we've got two satellites in space at the moment um, and we're about to, well, first half of next year, we'll be introducing business grade products on those satellites. So at the moment, the focus has been on making sure people in remote areas can just access internet, okay? Now we're actually going to be developing the product more. So um, can a remote business get this guaranteed speed up and down? Is there more capacity um, for a business to, to operate better? Um, can we look at things like we know access to social services is important in, in remote communities. Can we um, make, say, .gov.au websites um, unmetered so they don't actually use data? Um, can we develop a prepaid solution for NBN? Um, that suits people in remote communities better. So I think now that we've got our satellites up there and they're working really well, we can start to look at the future for those communities and, and see how we can bespoke solutions or tailor solutions to meet their needs a lot better. And we're quite excited about that. Uh, I've got a couple of questions. Yes. Um, first one, how far away do you think gigabit trains are? Well, it's interesting you say, because gig, in Darwin, gigabit speeds are available now on fibre, but you need to have a retailer who will sell you one, all right? So you can, I mean, we, we have a wholesale gigabit product available, but what you need is a, a retailer to productize that and then sell it to their customer. So I think last year, an RS, I think we've got about 170 gigabit plans across the nation. Um, Last year, a company called My Republic, um, they entered the NBN market and they ran this promo and they, they said, they asked for applications from towns around Australia and, and said, we will launch a gigabit product into the town with the best business case. And Wollongong um, won it in New South Wales. But there wasn't really much take up. They, um, they heavily discounted it. So they probably made a loss delivering the service. Um, but it was more of a, a marketing gig than, you know, a real benefit to the end user and it, it wasn't widely adopted. And um, But it's something we're, we're discussing with providers at the moment because certainly when the fibre does go directly to the premise, you know, that's premises, sorry, that's a, um, that's a possibility, but it's finding a retailer who will deliver that to you. And the second question is, seeing as Darwin is so remote from the rest of the country, mm -hmm. are you looking at like um, providing more redundancy of the links back to the rest of the country? Yeah. And yeah, certainly, um, look, that's probably a little bit beyond my technical um, expertise, um, but I know we have put a, a lot of redundancy into the network so that you've, you've got to have fibre two ways so that if it breaks one way, there's still a link the other way. Um, I've just found that out because we, you know, we're, the NT government would like us to build fibre to, you know, all, all remote communities, which would be a nice to have but extremely cost prohibitive. And one of the reasons is because we have to build fibre uh, back and forth so that there is that redundancy in the network. Um, so the redundancy, I'd be very confident in in saying yes, uh, it won't be an issue. And with capacity, I guess it would be as it would be across anywhere across the network. You know, our purpose, at, our focus at the moment is to make sure every home and business can connect. Um, but as the needs increase, capacity being one, then, then we'll need to upgrade the network to meet those demands. Um, and if Darwin was one of the first cities built, it may be one of the first cities through that upgrade process. I'm curious about mm. um, some of our user perspective. The upgrade solution sometimes the rollouts have not been particularly good. Mm -hmm. From an end user point of view, how can they manage that? So look, I guess from an end user perspective, we want you to channel all your inquiries through to the service provider. That's who you have your transaction with. That's who you um, that's who you're a customer of. Um, and that's not a cop-out from NBN, that's just the best way to manage it because we'd hate for someone to go, well, do I call NBN, do I call my provider, who should I call? If Your provider should be able to either help you with the issue or put you in touch with NBN. So the service, if it is an NBN issue, the service provider should be managing that on your behalf. They can raise a case with NBN, they can get a case number which has a KPI um, and manage that with you. And what's really 
on industry bill finishing. So I would have think, thought if it's a service fault, I think we've got five days for a standard or 20 days for a complex. Um, but I would like to think the majority of issues should be solved within the five days. Yeah. But I do. Well, I've got a, I've got a couple of slides I'll show you just about. I'll talk to you a little bit about NBN Local as well because we're quite passionate about this, and you can see the brand on my on my chest here. So, in October last year, we launched what we call NBN Local, um, and that was there's a team of 25 of us um, around the country, um, and you can see SANT. We have the three of us, myself, Chris, and Jill. And the design of MBN Local was when we, when, when we all came together, um, we had an area of the business that would do the government relations, we had an area of the business that would do media, and then we had my old group which would do community and stakeholder engagement. What we wanted to do was be able to come to an area so I can come up to Darwin, I can do engagements like this, I can go and meet with the NT government on Thursday, I can go on radio in the morning or, or do an interview. Before we couldn't do that. so. We want it to be a one-stop shop. Um, really our main focus was though to better serve regional and remote areas of Australia um, because they were the people that didn't seem to have the awareness of NBN or didn't seem to have the ability to engage with NBN um, to have their questions answered. So this just shows you a few of our, our key stakeholders. Obviously we are a political beast and as we get close to an election we get dragged in um, a certain direction but MPs and electorate officers are probably one of our most important stakeholders. Local government, um, community groups such as you know this, business groups especially, um, chambers of commerce and business associations, media, and then our state-based stakeholders. So I'm up here at the moment attending the Northern Territory Food Futures Conference. So peak bodies like the um, NT Farmers and NT Cattlemen's Association big membership bases uh, that we need to get in touch with. So we've been operating for, what would that be, six to nine months now. Um, and already this is you know, a heat map of the areas we've, we've reached across Australia. Um, we have these vehicles here that we call Roadmaster vehicles. So they look pretty neat um, with their branding, but they also have a satellite dish on top. And we can park that vehicle anywhere in Australia, um, put that dish up and connect to one of our SkyMaster satellites and demonstrate a live NBN connection. So um, just in the first, this is only the first four months of this year, this is an old slide, we visited um, 213 towns around Australia, um, 456 hours on the road and over 40,000 kilometres travelled. And um, for us, my team, that culminated in a, in a two week trip from Darwin all the way to Adelaide. We drove in one of these, so over 3,000 Ks um, and I think about 12 engagements along the way um, through Catherine, Tennant Creek, Alice Springs and then down through, well we spent some time in the APY lands and then down through Cooper Pedy, Roxby Downs and Hawker. So um, I guess we, you know, we understand the importance of connectivity in regional areas. I, I kind of get sick of people in, in metro areas, especially Adelaide, saying to me, you know, why the hell are you going to the APY lands when I need faster internet in Adelaide? And I'd say, well, the people don't actually have access to internet. Whereas, you know, a lot of people don't realise what they have at home is, is fine for their needs. They just want it faster so they can do a speed test and, and have a number come up, um, you know, when really we're about making sure that, you know, this whole land mass can access internet, not just these capital cities. Um, and, you know, it's generated some great stories for us as well. So we've had some really positive media where, you know, NBN gets a bit of a, I don't know what it's like in Darwin so much because we're, you know, we're a bit past the rollout now, but, you know, you wouldn't have to wait too long for a metro paper to put a negative NBN story in there. So by us having a bigger regional presence, it's just generated all this positive media for us, which has been great. And now if the rollout scales through the other capital cities, we're hoping to bring um, some of this positivity uh, along the way. This is just shows you these are people in our, our national team. Um, so, and we have a, everyone know Facebook, I assume? We have a platform at work called Workplace. It's the same interface as Facebook. And this is just some of the stuff I grabbed. So Marcello is my colleague in Queensland and he took one of the, our vehicles to the um, Julia Creek Dirt and Dust Festival. So um, yeah, out in the middle of nowhere. Um, we, we, the, the um, the uh, event organisers were able to do FPOS ticket sales for the first time ever. 
because they had connectivity through our vehicle. They were able to provide free Wi-Fi to people attending and people were able to take, you know, people love to take photos of themselves and upload it literally to the world and really help promote that, um, that event. And these were the speeds he was getting, so 25 megabits per second out at Julia Creek. You know, no infrastructure there, um, but, you know, faster than a lot of metro um, capital cities at the moment. This is Graham on the right did a similar thing in a music festival in regional Victoria. Um, they'd never had FPOS sales available, so they have all the food trucks, which are cash only. Um, same with the, the um, ticket sales at the gates, but we're able to provide connectivity to all the retailers, give them more sales through FPOS and a better experience for, for the people attending the events. Uh, another thing we do is um, obviously attend regional conferences. I went to the Northern Territory uh, Isolated Children's Parents Association conference in March. Um, since then, we've been to the SA Conference and the Queensland Conference as well. We were here just a couple of weeks ago for Broadband for the Bush. Um, some great networking opportunities for us um, and great opportunities for us to engage with regional and remote Australia. Obviously, areas that are pretty hard for us to reach on a regular basis. So we like to come together um, where a good, good cross-section of those communities are. Um, this is my colleague Jane, who's up here with me at the moment at a, a Wheatbelt Conference in um, uh, in WA. So all across the country we're trying to get in front of these, um, um, these, these larger audiences that, that represent that part of the country. Uh, fixed wireless is obviously one of our main technologies. We've, we've got a big focus on fixed wireless at the moment, so going along to community halls and talking to people um, about the technology, taking our truck along um, to demonstrate the product, and yes, the one I enjoyed the most was um, just, just recently, so in the middle of May, um, we went to, um, with, with Marianne and David, um, went and visited the, the Lanapoi homelands and some other remote Arnhem Land communities and, um, you know, over the course of a week. And it was just a, it was a fantastic experience um, to visit those communities. A great look, a great personal experience for me, but also a great opportunity for us um, to really do, you know, drive some health um, and education benefits, but also lifestyle benefits. And, and one I probably didn't realise so much was, you know, some possible business benefits that connectivity can bring. You know, in, in Warrawee we saw this beautiful art gallery, uh, but there's no online presence for them to actually sell their, sell their wares. So um, they rely on foot traffic, which I'm not sure they're that keen on generating a lot of foot traffic. Um, so, uh, you know, Simple connectivity over SkyMaster represents a great opportunity for them to have an online shop front, for example. Um, we visited a lot of health clinics, met some amazing um, you know, doctors and nurses who work at these clinics. And I think it was just good to hear from them their challenges um, with connectivity. And, and again, they weren't looking necessarily for a really fast um, internet solution, but they needed a reliable one. They needed one that always, you know, always worked when they needed it to and, and gave them that guaranteed um, upload and download speed. And um, that's something we've come away from and, and we're working as a, um, certainly our satellite team and, um, and myself are working on some, some bespoke solutions. And, and again, not super, um, not super complex solutions either, just you know, prioritising video traffic, for example, in a health clinic. It doesn't require a heap of work from us, but if you can guarantee that face a FaceTime call will hold or, a, um, you know, the video conference equipment that people are using, um, you know, that's, that's, that's going to deliver a massive benefit for that community if people can be treated remotely rather than having to be medevaced out um, when really they could have been treated on site had we had simple video conference capabilities available. Um, so we're really excited about um, where the, what this might evolve to. Um, and like I said, I, I see this as a, a good opportunity in the NT, um, given that you know, we've built pretty much all of the town centres out. It's, it's wanting to increase awareness of, of our product and, and its capabilities um, and the social benefits it can have in, the, in these type of communities. Yes? I'm very ignorant. I don't understand how people continue to access that once you win. Because they don't have fibre. So yep. Satellite. Yep, so satellite is delivered via um, so so you don't need our vehicle obviously to access satellite. So any of these premises out here would have a satellite dish on the roof. 
and then wiring to a modem inside. Um, every that's that's all installed free by NBN. Well, I reckon it's a mix of there's no awareness of it, so people don't actually know it exists. Um, so that's you know that's on us to work harder there. Um, and maybe there is an affordability piece. You know, the installation is free, but just like you and I in, in the capital city, we still need to pay a provider a monthly fee to give us a service. So, I mean, that's that's one of the harder things for us to approach because our, we, we're not trying to sell you anything. We're just making you aware of the technology, educating you about how to use it, and maybe facilitating the equipment install. You've then got to choose a provider and pay them for a service monthly. So when you did your demos, who was your provider? Uh, we use different providers depending on the vehicle because we don't want to be tied to one provider. Okay, so yeah. who are the providers? Of satellite. Yeah. So there's 11 satellite providers. I can certainly show you afterwards. But no, I just um, they are yeah, there's 11. And I guess what I didn't touch on, a great thing now is people in regional areas have had a choice of Telstra or Telstra for forever, right? Now you can choose, if you're on satellite, you can choose from 11 different providers. So more choice, more competition, um, better prices for the end user. In fixed wireless, which is in a lot of regional areas, I think there's up, there's over 80, 80 different providers. And in, in your capital cities, like I've got a choice of over 100 in Adelaide, and I work for NB, and I haven't heard of 80% of them, you know. But I, and no one looks through a, you know, no one looks through 11 different plans or 100 different plans and compares. But if you look through a couple, you know, you can hold your provider to account. You can demand a better price, and and just knowing that there's a lot of providers out there. Um, obviously helps people understand that there's more competition and that should drive better prices. Um, yeah. So just more of a comment. Yes. That, um, certainly the, the, the experience that we found in remote communities is that people tend to prepay. Yes. So for mobile telephone services through Telstra, there is prepay. Yep. By, you buy what you can afford to buy at the time. Yep. It doesn't impinge on your credit rating or the fact that don't have a bank account or any of those sort of details and I think mm. that's one of the things that we as Broadband for the Bush have tried to do is, is talk to the NBN about forming a package that allows for prepay service rather than postpay mm -hmm. services. So the postpay services is a very standardised kind of uh, Western concept. Yeah. The prepay service is pay for what you can afford to pay for today. Yes. And I think that's one of the things that we're trying to encourage uh, NBN to come up with in terms of a, a solution. Absolutely. So, well, I, I can talk to that a little bit. So, you're right. It, it, it is. It does sit with the service provider. But what we've done is um, through through organisations like Broadband for the Bush and through our engagement, you know, we've we've realised that remote communities need a, a more bespoke solution. So, we recently put out an expression of interest to all our service providers. Uh, for someone to work with us um, to determine a, um, a, a better, a better um, use of, of SkyMaster satellite for remote communities. So we've asked them to consider things like a prepaid option. Like if, if I use this community as an example, do we put a dish here and make it a community Wi-Fi solution that people can bring their smartphone to or bring their laptop to and connect to rather than put a dish on every roof of the home, which probably isn't practicable. So we've, we've had some um, really positive responses to that expression of interest and we have, I think, about half a dozen providers who've indicated that they want to work with us um, in being a provider of choice for, for remote communities. Um, content filtering is another one we've asked them to consider because we know that you know, if we're to, if we could, we're to go to some regional centres and, and bring fast internet, people are going to go, fantastic, that's great, see you later. But you bring it to a community like this, you introduce a whole lot of social um, concerns as well. So we want to be, um, I guess we want to recognise that and we don't want to just say, here you go, here's fast internet and walk away. We understand that, you know, it does facilitate access to gambling and porn and cyberbullying and things like that and, and you know, we're conscious that... Um, we need to play a role in, in that education as well. So, um, yeah, it's a great point, David, and, and, and certainly um, something that we're hoping will develop between now and the end of the year as we work with these people who've expressed an interest um, to, to hopefully trial some solutions in some communities.
Well, I think that we can wrap that up. Thank you very much for coming, everybody. We'd like to give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.